Hey, everybody. <clears throat> or hey, everybody, if you fit puberty. <sighs> One more time, but lower. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey there, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> this is a weird Johnny Bravo vibe. And welcome back to another episode of Who Is My Doctor? Who is my doctor? Who is indeed? I'm your host, Zach, and I know a lot about Doctor Who. And I'm also your host, Cassie, and I don't know a lot about Doctor Who. And today we're watching... I. This is Series 5, Episode 1, and I think this might be my most watched episode of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say it's the best episode, but this is like comfort food doctor who to me (laughs) like there's not like the stakes in it aren't super high but the episode's really good i think this is the best i think this is the best introduction one could get to this to the series doctor comfort (laughs) food thank you i've been thinking about that for a little too long (laughs) it's it's called the 11th hour Uh uh-huh it is the introduction of matt smith's 11th doctor uh-huh. And I don't know if you remember this or how much of it you remember, rather. But once long ago, like pre COVID long ago, like I think not even when we I think before we even lived together long ago, I showed you one episode of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. This was that episode. I do remember that because you were really trying to get me to watch it and to like it. And you said, come on, just this one. Just this one, it's a recent ditch doctor. And I was like, I don't know. I just specifically remember the TARDIS ending up in like a backyard of a house. There's lots of ivy. (laughs) Yes. uh, So this is, as you remember, at the end of the end of time, uh, the 10th doctor regenerated into the 11th doctor. But the regeneration caused the TARDIS to explode a little. Yes. uh, Because the doctor, for some reason... Hasn't learned yet not to regenerate inside the TARDIS. Where else is he going to go? That's his home, dude. Just step outside. Or go deeper in the TARDIS. (laughs) There's so many (laughs) rooms. Regenerate in the closet. Stop regenerating right next to the engine. Yeah, that's my thing. Go in the swimming pool. Yeah, to our understanding, it's bigger on the inside yet. We've only ever really seen... The closet. Yeah, they have. They they haven't really done a whole lot with exploring the TARDIS. Um, really, even in the early, even in the original series, they didn't do a lot. Most of the places you go were just like empty rooms that look kind of like the TARDIS's main room. Uh, so regenerate in one of those, fool! <laughs> you goof. Uh, this this is Matt Smith's first episode. Uh, also uh, taking over as showrunner is Stephen Moffat, who. Uh, who was the creator of the Weeping Angels? Uh, also the creator. See now, if you wanted to get me hooked, that's the episode you should show me first. Yeah, I should have. I, I wanted a place that I feel like is a good entry point, and the eleventh hour I feel like is the strongest entry point because you don't really need to know a whole lot going into it. You've described the Doctor as sort of a Peter Pan type figure before. Yeah, this, I, that is a hill I will die on. This episode I feel is the, one of the strongest cases for that. Uh, but you'll because he abducts a small fairy. <laughs> uh, this also and banishes her from the treehouse. Uh, when Stephen Moffat took over the role or took over a showrunner, he had originally wanted an older doctor. Uh, he had wanted someone who would be more like in their 40s or 50s because they, had, you know, you'd had two relatively young actors playing him. And this character had historically been in like his late 40s. Mm-hmm. But instead, He picked Matt Smith, who is actually the youngest actor to ever play the doctor, uh, beating out the previous holder, uh, Peter Davison. Would you like to guess how old Matt Smith was when he took this role? Twenty six. He was indeed twenty six. He was younger than either of us are right now. Well, because we had talked about that before. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm not going to try to be like, I'm so smart. Because I was having uh, an existential crisis afterwards because I went, I... I am almost 30 and I have done nothing. 
Except for this podcast. Except for this podcast. And so Which will be my legacy, it seems. Since nobody wants to hire a theater artist. <laughs> and so Matt Smith took over this role, I think because, as you will find, he has an old soul about him as he plays this character. Like there's a, there's a definitely a youthful exuberance he brings to it, but there's also a part of him that it just feels like, oh, you're a thousand years old. OK, I buy that. <laughs> like a a maturity. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll see there's a weight to him. Because uh, like there is a if we if we want to go down uh, this side route, because there is the people or like there are the people that in their lives have had a lot of like trauma and stuff. So they mature. Yeah. A lot faster than everybody else because they have to. And then the people that are or then children that you're like, oh, they're an old soul. And that's because this isn't their That's because they have to be an adult when they get well, home. Well, that or if, if you want to look at the more like, hi, we're going to venture into non Zach friendly territory, a little more woo woo for you, Dr. Woo woo. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> any child that you're like, oh, yeah, they're just they've got an old soul. Yeah, that's because this isn't their first time here. If you believe in reincarnation, like mm-hmm. I do. Oh, OK, you are a person that is built by thousands of years of you know people making new people Mm -hmm. i mean even if you just want to talk about it like historically there's that idea of you're beset upon by the last seven generations Mm -hmm. so i mean there there is some some like psychology there to it where like the like the trauma of your ancestors gets handed down for generations until it finally works itself out because there's also the thing too where it's like people now that have adhd it's like it's not a crutch but it's not as useful as it would have been when you had to stay awake and keep your ears peeled for wild animals wanting to (laughs) eat you but in this case for the doctor yeah he literally regenerates yeah i do i do like the idea though of if we're Looking at that logic and we're looking at like this is somebody who is comprised of generations of people before him. This is his 11th like iteration. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he is built upon or he is made of 11 different iterations or 10 other iterations of himself. Yeah. Getting back to the episode itself here or rather to matt smith uh i think he's probably the second most famous doctor of the modern era he's definitely the only other one that i yeah he knew of coming into this partly because i think he he was at the end of the tumblr girl era uh which isn't which again isn't to disparage tumblr girls but it's more than just to disparage the end of tumblr <laughs> you know that was he was the last one to get shared like wildfire um, and as such, has a lot of, I think, his own tropes that you've probably heard of. Uh, what are some things that you know about Matt Smith's incarnation? So I think this was like all of my friends' favorite doctors. OK, because there was one kid. I won't I won't name names, but he has one of the coolest names like <laughs> I've ever heard. He was one of the coolest kids I'd ever known. I had such a crush on him when I was growing up. He wanted nothing to do with me. (laughs) Um, But something that he did as like an everyday look in high school, particularly, is he would wear a bow tie. Okay. And in or later on in life had been like, oh, yeah, I was only doing that because like I was really into Doctor Who. And I understand that it's. Matt Smith's doctor that is the bow tie. Yes, Matt Smith is the bow tie. And the and, fez, yeah. Uh, he does occasionally wear a fez. Uh, we'll get, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the fez when we get to the part where he starts wearing it, because uh, there is kind of a funny story attached to it. Um, but I'll get, I'll get to that then. But yeah, it was the, the bow tie that, that I know specifically. And one of our very good friends this is his doctor yeah uh he's also my doctor uh he is my he is my favorite by a pretty long stretch uh and this is and not to disparage any other doctors they got the doctors are all fine actors that this is just this is the kind of doctor that like really gets me into the show mm-hmm. and there are there are always aspects of this in other doctors too but i think uh 11 and 2 are really the two doctors that portray this sort of like 
for not wanting to over describe it, sort of like a male Miss Frizzle energy. OK, um, you'll see more of it when we get into the show. I don't want to. Again, don't I don't want to say airhead, but just like a nut, like a like a, the absent minded professor is a thing that uh, I, I hear that that concept getting thrown around a lot where it's he's not stupid. If anything, he might just kind of play a little flighty. But uh, but there's a part of it that's there's a sort of a fun manic energy to them, like a manic um, pixie. And Matt Smith is on record. Manic pixie time, Lord. Matt Smith is on record saying that uh, Patrick Trout and the second doctor is the one that was the most inspiration for his doctor. Okay. As I've, as I've said, this story is being, this show is being taken over by Stephen Moffat, um, to just briefly touch on the things he wrote. Uh, are you my mummy? Uh, the French murder robots, uh, the doctor and Madame de Pompadour, uh, and the horse, the, the weeping <laughs> angels and, uh, river song, uh, mm-hmm. the science of the library two parter. Those were his stories throughout those seasons throughout, Russell T. Davies run. Okay, all bangers. And yeah, pretty much everyone agreed that was the right call because he consistently was. Oops, all bangers. Yeah, he was consistently the best writer of those four seasons. Um, so everyone, everyone agreed he should take it over. By the end of his run, some people got a little tired of Moffat's isms, but we'll get to those when we get to them. Um, so, but knowing that those were his episodes, what sort of things are you expecting from him running the show now? Can I be honest? What's that? I don't fucking know. Okay. I mean, they are. I like I I want I I need to emphasize uh, I am not looking at this as an academic. Mm -hmm. I am here for the vibes. (laughs) I'm here for a good time. If you had told me that I needed to be taking more rigorous notes and looking at themes and motifs, I've just been looking at color, dude. Well, I was more thinking they put David Tennant in blue a lot. I was more talking about uh, sort of the vibes off of those four up those four stories i don't know okay all right well if you don't know then you know that's fine uh but like they- i don't want to say psychological thriller but i do think that we'll see more episodes and make you go huh but <laughs> also go, this is fucking doctor who there's a lot of episodes that make you go huh <laughs> Well, uh, we can find out a little bit about that as we watch this first season. Um, so let's get into the professor here. Uh, Hell yeah. So right now, my total, ladies and gentlemen, is that I have 69 points. Well, that means you're not allowed to get a single professor right for the rest no, of the series. Unfortunately <laughs> not. Uh, I can't I can't get a single point correct until I have 420 guesses. <laughs> and then we have to stop the game altogether. <laughs> All right. So with 69 points on the board and uh, truly I can't get that. I can't. We're lucky that my <laughs> you just one of start my f- guessing like the total opposite of whatever the question is. See, because we're at a point now where it's like 69. Great number. One of my actual favorite numbers, though, in all of all time is 75. Oh, uh, OK. So I'm like, ooh, I got to get up to 75. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get you a couple points closer today. So the. I, I I know we've already seen the episode, but it was so long ago. I didn't necessarily feel like yeah, I had to. Do you to... think I remember anything? No, 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 no. The only thing that I remember from that episode is watching it in the old apartment and going, why is there so much hair? There's not even an animal here. <laughs> <laughs> Since I kind of know that you wouldn't really remember the episode, I don't feel afraid asking you really basic stuff again. Especially because I think it's been like six years maybe five or six years at this point since I've shown it to you. I'm, I'm not surprised if you don't remember this. No, I flushed it from my memory, Zach. So in I the- didn't <laughs> enjoy it. So it went, <laughs> I just went, okay, that was 45 minutes. Flush. And now we're back here doing a whole podcast about <laughs> I've, it. I've snared you in the trap once again. Uh, so this episode features two different alien races. And so the two profacy points are for describing each of these races. Uh, the first one, is just called Prisoner Zero, and he looks mostly like a kind of sea creature. What the fuck? What the fuck? I don't know. A kind of like a sea creature? Yeah. What? So I'm just I'm asking you to name the sea creature he looks like. No. New question. <laughs> kind of like a sea creature. What the? That could be anything. There's so many. There are so many. I mean, you got it. You the last time I asked you a question about them looking like a sea creature, you got it bang on in like one try. Hell yeah, horseshoe crabs, baby. 
So basically, I'm I'm taking a second crack at that egg and seeing if you can. Oh, that's never going to happen again. <laughs> I was trying to see if you're able to uh, to to hit the nail on the head a can, second do time. Do I get? Can I? Uh, let me ask this: mammal or fish? Uh, they are they are fish. Okay, so that does that does help because that eliminates then all like like dolphins and whales, e- basically. Yeah. And otters. Seals. I will say they're they're kind of creepier looking ones too. If that changes, if that impacts your opinion at all. Okay. Like a, I right now because you said patient zero mm-hmm. sea creature. I'm thinking primordial soup. Okay. Thinking horseshoe crab. <laughs> <laughs> Not creepier looking because cr- horseshoe crabs are creepier looking. They're not wrong. I don't. I don't know that I want to. I will tell you it's not horseshoe crab again. Just okay. in, in fairness, I'm not. This isn't like some trick question where I've already asked you it once and the answer is the same. I did that once already. I can't do it again. Like a lobster. A lobster? Yeah, like some kind of crustacean. OK. OK, I did. I will say I, when I said fish, I wasn't counting crustaceans. If that. Uh, oh, OK. Then never mind. Like a squid. Squid. Yeah. OK. A, cephal- I, I, a cephalopod. Are you counting cephalopods as fish? Uh, in fairness, because I already said about the lobster, I will say no, I wasn't. Okay, so we're, we're so we're you're talking, talking about fish, fish, yes, anglerfish, anglerfish. Okay, with the or little. no, because you would you would specifically tell me if it was a Coca Cola fish, <laughs> you mean a, a coelacanth? <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know it's I know it's called a coelacanth. Okay, yes, but when we first caught one in Animal Crossing, we could not figure out what it, how it was pronounced, so we just called it a Coca Cola fish. Um, all right. So the first guess for Prisoner Zero is that it looks like an anglerfish. Yeah, because those are pretty. F- those are pretty. Fu- those things are huge. They're very like they, that's the thing, though, is that they can be anywhere from like football size, like kind of small and compact, like designer sized mm-hmm. to like, like football stadium sized. <laughs> well, not exactly. Well, but no. That's exaggeration. But yeah, yeah but they are huge. Um, all They're, right dead eyes and giant maw <laughs> and then uh, the Ugh. other alien species and this is called the atraxi and the atraxi uh, a-t-r-a-x-i uh, look like a particular a- part of the human body a part of the human body mm-hmm. not the whole body just one part of it internal or external uh external okay i'm gonna say foot and they look like a foot yeah, why not? <laughs> they're like the thumb thumbs from Spy Kids, but they're all feet. Yeah, or like an ear. Ugh. <laughs> Just a walking ear. Just you said they ones. look like a part of the external human body, so that eliminates all like. Yeah, they can't look like a heart or a stomach. And like that would be odd if it looked like a giant pair of titties. <laughs> I would like that. Likewise, could you imagine Doctor the, Who in the Attack of the Bazongas? Like, could you imagine the BBC okaying an alien that looks like a dick and balls? <laughs> I mean, knowing knowing Moffat's run, that wouldn't be out of the question. Um, but all right, we will find out if Prisoner Zero looks like an anglerfish or vagina, and if the Atraxi look like a walking ear. We, I said foot. Oh, foot. Sorry. Or if the Atraxi look like a foot as we watch. Wait, but is it ear? Because you you seem to remember ear much better. <laughs> That's what I was listening with. No, Atraxi tracks in the sand. Jesus foot. <laughs> there was only one set of footprints. That's because I'm that's because I am one foot. Yeah. <laughs> one set of footprints yeah and one foot print <laughs> look over oh. and we will find out if the atraxi look like feet as we watch the 11th Just hour really outing moffat's fetish right <laughs> out the gate <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Igor's Evil Coffee. Hello there. You look like someone who hisses at the sun or wishes to put a curse upon your neighbors. Well, while I can't help with that, I can bring a little malicious joy to your morning. 
whether it's maniacally laughing as the lightning strikes behind you or raising an army of the dead to do your dishes. What? Igor's evil coffee is sure to add a little extra flair from the dark magic that overcaffeinates the beans. And that's not all that makes this dark roast special. Igor's evil coffee is the only cup of Joe made with the ashes of a real guy named Joe. Igor's evil coffee, because even bad people deserve good mornings. And we are back from the 11th hour. Question. Okay. What is with Stephen Moffat and bodies of water? (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean? Well, we have Amelia Pond. River song. Mm -hmm. A duck pond. (laughs) Those are the the ponds and rivers. Well, it's just weird that you would have two characters that are named after bodies of water. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, maybe he just has like a motif. A a moth. Uh, Moth motif. Uh, my teeth, <laughs> my feet. Um, what, uh, what, what did you think, Cassie? New intro. Yeah, we got, we got a new intro. Uh, we've Very got... Dervisher. Yeah. Loved it. Music concrete. Come back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also composed by Murray Gold, just like the last several, the last, the last few arrangements were. Mm. I really feel like this episode is really where you could be like, oh, Murray Gold was just let loose. He can do whatever he wants now. What I liked, though, is that this... What I liked about this intro is that it felt more authentic to its origin. Okay. In that there were those blips and bobs and, you know, whoops and stuff that were written in the original text. Yeah. That then Delia Derbyshire went, I got this. (laughs) This This feels uh, like the... What she would have done. Yeah. If... If if it was not the 60s and she had access to an arrangement of sounds. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely uh, this is definitely one of my favorite intros that the show has. I, I, I will tell you that the intro changes quite a bit. I think Matt Smith has three different intros. Uh, the intro for most doctors will change at least once. I think the only one where I can't think of it changing was. Because oh Tenet's changed at the beginning of his run and then didn't change until now. Yeah. Um, because it was that particular intro reminded me of the um the camp scene in mm-hmm. Tarzan where it's just so much drones. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, they, they definitely they had only had like slight modifications to his arrangement, but I would still count it just because it is it is a change. The thirteenth doctor is the only one who I don't think her intro changed through her run on the show. Mm. Um but uh, we do have we have a new intro. We have a new doctor. We now have this uh, madman in a box, as he calls himself. Mm-hmm. Um, how, what did you think of uh, Matt Smith's first st- first outing as the doctor? Uh, I think you had said it earlier. Flighty. Yeah, he's like he's very smart, but his brain is just moving at a million miles an hour. It's the and it. I don't want to say it's unfortunate. But like this episode in particular Mm -hmm. really does like make make it concrete. All of my statements about the doctor having a Peter Pan quality. Yeah. Like I said, this episode very heavily leans on that, especially with the the I'll come back for you. Just just five minutes. Yeah. It's been 12 years Yep. because (laughs) that's what happens to Wendy, where she goes back to. You know, goes back to England and Peter says that he'll come back and visit her the next night. And by the time that he returns, she has a daughter of her own. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, there's something very interesting about like they even say at the beginning that Amelia Pond is sort of like a fairy tale name. Like he was he was hard leaning into that Peter Pan kind Mm -hmm. of aspect of it. Amelia Pond. Like a name in a fairy tale. But I, I definitely feel like Matt Smith plays the doctor like like he's fey you know like you're not he's wrong. not an alien i think that this man is really leaning into the fey aspect yeah he they definitely play up more of the science fantasy I think. of the like yeah. Ooh, cheeky we're gonna we're gonna let or the uh what was it the atrexy know that you're here by resetting everything to zero <laughs> 
We well, need the, to let them know that patient zero is here. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely more. I'm fucking with the physical world as much as I can. I think Moffat, or I think Davies really leaned more on like the sci fi aspects of it, or like, you know, the the things that did it were all, you know, like we saw in his last special, there was there was a, a, a medical device that turned everyone into the master. Mm hmm. Uh, but then when Moffat takes over, it really is more like the rules of reality are flexible here. So there's a, almost a cartoonish quality. Yeah. Which reminds you, this is a family show. This is meant for like people of all ages to enjoy. But I, I think this is I mean, the only other real intro to the show that people have talked about that you've seen is Rose. Because uh, David Tennant starts in sort of a weird place. There's not that's not really a place you could just pick up the show. But this is this is the other place. This is one of like four four places people say you can jump on the show. And I think this is the strongest of them because you just it, it gives you a lot of like the lore of the show without feeling bogged down by it. I suppose I, I do think back, but I was thinking back to when you showed me this episode mm -hmm. all those years ago, trying to figure out like, why didn't I like leech into it? And I think there are some things where because the doctor is moving at such a breakneck speed, it is a little off putting mm -hmm. because even though like you can identify with Amelia the entire time of just being like, I thought that I made this up. Yeah. I thought this was something that I dreamed, but how could it have been when there were so many things I know I saw? Mm -hmm. Cause you even see at the very end, it pans over her collection and her array of different drawings and figurines she had made over 12 years, each one getting a little bit better than the previous. Yeah, like you could really tell that she was. It was kind of like when kids have a thing that they draw. Yeah, well, like, it's, it's the doctor but, was her imaginary friend. Yeah, for, for like there was an episode years. of the or of uh, Bob's Burgers that we just watched where Gene had mentioned that. He drew a picture of an anger, a hot dog. And he's like, yeah, this is just what I'm drawing right now. <laughs> like every kid has a thing that they draw mm -hmm. and hers just so happened to be the doctor. Yeah. Uh, her rag, her raggedy doctor, because for most Fuck, of this episode, calling he's, him raggedy doctor, though, is so funny. I'm just a rag doctor. Me, 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 me. <laughs> Happy and freaking out all day. <laughs> Just a rag doctor. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's wander he's wandering around in the tattered remains of David Tennant's outfit for most of the episode. Uh, I think they just get more tattered as the episode yeah, goes on. Because he's running around at them. You know, I do I do sort of like that they let him find himself before he puts on his outfit. Because uh, David Tennant's doctor also kind of did that. He was just wearing pajamas for most of I the do, Christmas invasion. He didn't put on the coat until the end of the story. I do like that they make the that he says the phrase of he's still cooking. Yeah, because I've heard that now in so many other contexts that don't involve food. <laughs> like whenever uh, whenever I'm getting my hair done, Maddie will say that it needs to cook. Mm -hmm. And there's just something so silly to me about something that isn't food needing <laughs> time to cook. It is kind of funny that both uh, both 10 and 11 have fruit in their origins, uh, because when Tenant like wakes up in his uh, in the pajamas and he's yelling at the Santas, he's got an orange in his pocket. Yeah. And Matt Smith's first words as the doctor in this episode are, can I have an apple? <laughs> Yeah, so he so he had an apple in his pocket and David Tennant had an orange in his. That's why you could compare them as apples to oranges. <laughs> Aren't I clever? I'm really happy that this doctor didn't need to be roused from his slumber. Yeah, no, he he didn't need tea. From he needed fish fingers and custard. Jeez. After going through the entire pantry, it <laughs> the seems. The entire food pyramid. Because uh, it was an apple... Yeah, an apple was the first one. Bacon. Uh, he wanted yogurt. Uh, oh yeah, yogurt. But then he just he, that he hated yogurt because it's just stuff with bits in it. We would fair. <laughs> I feel like you've also had like, <laughs> you know, not autistic moments where you've <laughs> been like, I don't like this. It's just stuff with bits in it. I know that's how I've always felt about um, those like. I don't know that you would actually know what those are. That's mm -hmm. an Asian treat, but it's like a little jello cup that has like fruit bits in it or okay. like lychee jelly bits. Okay. 
That's just Jello with stuff in it. Uh, then it's uh, I never liked them. <laughs> then he says, uh, "You're you're Scottish. Fry something." And so she fries up some bacon. To which he went, "That's bacon. Are you trying to poison me?" <laughs> uh, and then it's beans. Uh, it is beans. I think the I will say I think the I think bacon beans is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, beans are evil. <laughs> Be- beans are evil. Bad bad beans. I think the bacon trying to poison me bit is a callback to I believe the third Doctor implies that aspirin can kill him. And so I think they have a similar beat there. Uh, then he asks for bread and butter. It's very simple. Bread and butter. And then he God, thro- the- <laughs> throws the plate out the door and yells and stay out. <laughs> That's my favorite. I use that gif on so many things. Mm. I used it when Trump got kicked out of office. When he, got, when he lost the last election, that was the, my response was, and stay out. Well, I also need you to remember, I'm a barista. So do you think that if you thought that I was going to plug beans are evil, bad, bad beans. <laughs> and if then, you thought I'm, I was I would start saying that every day now when I'm at work, you would be correct. <laughs> and then Amelia says, well, we've got some carrots. And he's like, what? Why would I want carrots? I'll tell you what I want. And he dips in. It's like, I want fish fingers and custard. And he uses the custard as a dipping sauce for the fish fingers. Me being the like crafty as I am, just would really love to know what exactly he's eating because it can't be fish fingers and custard. <laughs> A custard, I believe. The fish finger has to be some kind of like fried cake. <laughs> or it's like tofu. Well, because he's not actively eating. He's actively eating the stuff. Yeah. So it's either those are fish fingers and like mayo, something yeah. that has the same texture, but also I don't think that a, 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 an Englishman would eat mayonnaise like that. Mm-hmm. So because I was curious, I looked this up and according to Matt Smith, anyway, he really ate fish fingers and custard. That was really what he was eating on set for at least the first f- few takes. Eventually they swapped out to like a cake with a coconut breading. Uh, and according to Matt Smith, it was because the fish had gotten like cold and crusty and gross. But according to him, At least as far as he's ever said, he started off taking actual fish fingers and actual custard and eating it and surprisingly enjoying it. Anyway, back to the episode. Uh, And then after this long, like, montage of him being disgusted by food, uh, he goes, man, you're really you're really acquiescing to all of me. The 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 crack in your wall must be pretty scary. And they move on to the crack in the wall. Uh, I do like that. It's intro. She's introduced. Amelia, little Amelia, is introduced regarding the crack in her wall by praying to Santa. Mm-hmm. Praying to Santa, not unlike Lilo praying for a uh, for an angel, the nicest angel you have. I just- <laughs> Cut to the doctor climbing out of the TARDIS, soaking <laughs> wet. And then there's, but I also like that she established. She goes, "It's Easter, so I hope I'm not waking you." <laughs> I like that that means that she thinks that Santa sleeps. Santa hibernates the yeah. other 11 months of the year. <laughs> and then I, I do appreciate that she's like, or send a policeman. And then she looks at her window and it's a police box. I, I, I Like the first chunk of that episode is so good. Well, because uh, the little girl that they have playing Amelia is so cute. So fun fact about her. Uh, that's Karen Gillan's cousin. And nobody knew that, including them going into production. Fantastic. They did not know they were each other's cousins until Uh, like, yeah. uh, Because I went, damn, they really got somebody who looks like just like her, which can't be too hard. She's the the redhead with freckles. Yeah, no, they felt. Me's thinking that every redhead with freckles looks the same. (laughs) Whoops. It's all the soulless eyes, you know. Stop. (laughs) So they, uh, they, yes, they cast them separately. Wild to think that's Nebula. Right. Uh, Car- uh, her, her Every is- time I see her, I fall in love. <laughs> little, little, uh, little Amelia is played by Caitlin Blackwood. Uh, they did not know each other at the time, and they did not know that they were cousins until, I believe, mid through production. <laughs> they found that out. Um, just a funny little quinky dink that they were like, yeah, this girl looks just like Karen Gillan. Um, it's wild. Yeah. Cause uh, I wouldn't, 
I, I wouldn't look at one of my little cousins and say, yeah, me and Claire look just alike. <laughs> well, you've been slightly influenced by your Japanese father. Fair. I guess, yeah, if you're if you are Eurocentric and all parts of your family are Eurocentric. Mm-hmm. The doctor investigates the crack in the wall, uh, says that it's a crack in space and time, two points of space time that should never have touched. And when he opens it on the other side is a prison with a giant eyeball. Not a foot. Not a foot. So we might have discovered Moffat's fe- fetish, but if it is, it's eyes, not feet. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the all he keeps hearing is prisoner zero has escaped is uh, a voice that echoes through the crack in the wall. I hate that. Could you imagine just hearing that at all times or not even at all times at random times, just minding your own business, drawing a picture. Then you hear prisoner zero has escaped. It's like when we had a squirrel in the vent for a little bit, we would just occasionally hear it. It wouldn't be consistent. It would be random. Or like when we lived at the apartment and every so often you would hear our neighbors thunderous footsteps. <laughs> I forgot about another thing I wrote my I wrote down in my my notes. What's that? But you said you were in the library. Yeah. The swimming pools in the library. <laughs> so was the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I do. Yeah, so he's he's all pool. wet. <laughs> And he sp- he spends the whole time all wet, too. He never seems to dry off through all the food. The doctor has so many good little moments here. I really they really wrote a lot of good actor moments here. Mm-hmm. Uh, one in that the one in that scene is, you know, grown ups tell you everything's going to be fine. And you think they're probably lying to make you feel better. Yes. Everything's going to be fine. And then he runs out to the TARDIS as it starts to phase away. And he's like, it'll be a quick five minute hop. And I, you audibly went, it's not going to be five minutes. No, it was the second she ran back to her house and grabbed her cute little suitcase and just started putting as many things as she could find in the suitcase. Just like a stack of shirts, yeah. like a hat. Yeah, just stack it all in a little suitcase and then walk outside. And then outside. on her way back out, she managed to grab a coat and a hat so that she's prepared for any weather. <laughs> Oh, and then she no. comes out, sets the suitcase down and plops and, and sits, sits, sits and on waits it. on it. God damn. It was like, did you ever hear about Hachi? Uh, I don't know what that is. So it was in Japan. It was a Shiba Inu that would follow his like person every day to the train tracks, watch the train depart, go back home and then come back and wait for the train to, to come back mm-hmm. for his person. His person never came back. Oh. So Hachi just waited at the train for somebody who wasn't going to be back. Some real, uh, that episode of Futurama with the dog. <gasps> oh, <laughs> so that movie, they made a movie out of it that came out right after one of my dogs died. Oh, no. We, we had it on DVD. We put it by the TV. We never watched it. Yeah. And so the. The do- so we even get told it's definitely not been five minutes by this. Uh, Poor little Amelia was Hachi. Yeah. She was just waiting. We get told that it was definitely not five minutes because it does a close up on the clock and it does a crossfade until the clock is set, shows set a different time entirely. Like yeah, several a different hours. time of day. Yeah. Uh, the sun is out uh, and the doctor arrives and starts running into the house and... Uh, immediately gets thwacked on the head with a cricket bat. And I do like that when he wakes up, he's like, oh, whack on the head. Just what I needed. <laughs> well, because while he's passed out is when we go to the hospital. Go to the, ho- the hospital. Or all the comatose patients. Yeah, they're calling for you. They all woke up at the same time and said, doctor. <laughs> yeah, they, and they do it in front of that doctor. Good. <laughs> I'm glad because the entire time she's making that poor nurse feel like an idiot. Yeah, we meet uh, Nurse Rory is who we meet in that moment. Rory. Yeah, Nurse Rory, played Rory by Arthur the, Darville. Rory is the most English name. <laughs> and he's such a such a meek little lad. <sighs> he's just, aw, Rory. <laughs> um, and then as the doctor wakes up, uh, we meet Karen Gillan dressed as a policewoman. Mm-hmm. Certified policewoman with fish or uh, with a... With <laughs> <laughs> but not fishnets, but with uh, stockings. Yeah, with stockings on. Really should have been the first indication, like, oh, this is not. Uh... Well, I went, wow, they really let their police officers dress up, don't they? <laughs> nope. Uh, but it was, yes, it is interesting seeing Karen Gillan. It's also interesting because at this point, I'm so used to seeing her as Nebula. When they do her as Nebula, obviously she has like 
a layer of uh, latex makeup on her whole face. Like, she has a basically a second skin. Yeah. And so there's a part of it's like, that's not what her head is shaped like. But I'm like, no, she's just usually bald and covered in latex when I see her in Marvel movies. Uh, I just for, I've forgotten what her actual head is shaped like. She is the companion for uh, actually a couple of seasons. She runs, I think, two. She runs two and a half seasons. Um, so she'll be she'll be with us for a little bit. Cool. Um, I don't want to get my hopes up because I was like, man, I really like her. Yeah, she's a little skeptical. I love this. Yeah, she's she's skeptical and a little spunky. Uh, very, very much Rose adjacent, but with the caveat of she doesn't have parents except for an old lady aunt. Yeah, who was presumably dead by the time we get to that first, by the time we get to the future, because we don't see hide nor hair of her. I thought the old lady was her aunt. Which old lady? The one that they talked oh, no, to. That was her grand. That was they call her Gran. Oh, and well, I thought it was like the younger guy, like, oh, that's his grandma, but that's her aunt. I didn't. Like I don't weird, like timey wimey family dynamics. I don't think so, because they refer to they refer to Jeff as her friend, not as her like cousin or something like that, mm. um, which uh, we'll, we'll get to him. Uh, but we, yeah, presumably if she lives in that house. Yeah. Uh, and she has lived there her whole life, uh, which is why it's so fucked up when the doctor's like, hey, there are six rooms here. Can you imagine for just a minute if you look down the hall one day and just saw a door that hadn't been there before? I want that to happen so bad. I need more storage in this house. <laughs> just an extra closet. Oh my God. That's so, I'm so eager for whenever like we move into a new house mm -hmm. for me to discover a room. And uh, as now that now that Amy's noticed it for the first time, she starts walking back to to that door to open that it. room. Also, that door has visible scratches on it. Well, yeah, because the only thing that goes in it is a giant eel monster. <laughs> Big old teeth. Big old teeth. That's how, that's how he opens the doors with his teeth. He doesn't have any hands. <laughs> <laughs> he pushes it open with his teeth. <laughs> that's why it's covered in scratches. Uh, and as as the uh, another great quote that I really enjoy is that as he's telling Amy not to go in the door, he just goes, do I have a face that no one listens to again? <laughs> Makes you wonder which how many of his faces do not get listened to. Or which one, which one, which one did faces, get listened to. Yeah. Which one of his like several faces does he feel like got the most listening to? <laughs> I mean, I feel like D David Tennant got shadow monsters to listen to him monologue. So that's yeah, because he's pointy. <laughs> Matt Smith is very like weirdly like round. Um, he's friend shaped. <laughs> He's and not so a threat. They Amy walks inside and uh, they she finds the sonic screwdriver has popped up on the table and gotten covered in goo. Mm. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> just goo here. Delicious eel goo. Nothing else to see does not look like any other bodily <laughs> fluid. <laughs> Certainly not from an eel shaped body part. Uh. <laughs> uh, uh yes the uh the the animal i was going for when i asked you about sea creature for prisoner zero was eel uh but i will take anglerfish if only because it has the same fucking horrifying teeth god i hate i hate those teeth. and the teeth carry over to every body it has so i will definitely count <laughs> prisoner zero as an anglerfish Thank if you. only for the horrifying teeth Thank uh, you. so that's one point for you today so prisoner zero is confronting them just outside the room and he's turned into a man and a dog. But for some reason, he's getting the mouths all wrong and the man is barking. It's a good dog, too. I kept I kept hoping the dog would start talking. I did as well. I'm happy the dog didn't start talking. It might have been but also the most like well groomed Roddy. <laughs> he was so sweet. I'm glad. Don't ruin this perfectly good dog. And I mean, I will say the dog was a surprisingly good actor. It kept it kept this like absolute stone face in a way where it's like, oh, okay. that's just Rottweilers for you. Yeah. They're awesome. Or it's just it like, was the way that like when the actor would look, the dog would look. And I know that that's the trainer and that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's them doing little movie magic to make the dog react. But he did such a good job. <laughs> yes, he did. 
they they start getting cornered by it until you start hearing the Atraxi echo through the sky that the human residence has been surrounded. Prisoner Zero will vacate the human residence or the human residence will be incinerated, is what they keep saying over and over and over again. Quickly found to be broadcasting on everything from ice cream trucks to TV channels. To people's Walkmans, too. Yeah, people's, uh, she's listening on her phone on her phone and it's the wrong things coming into her headphones. And they, they burst into the house of what appears to be uh, Amelia, possibly Amelia's grandmother, possibly just an old. It's a small town. So there's a very real chance that it's like, yeah, we call her grand because she's everyone's grandmother in this town. Fair. Because this town only has like 60 people in it. And we get uh, what another one of our bit parts in Doctor Who goes on to great success bits. Uh, Jeff, the tall buff guy. Yeah, uh, he is Tom Hooper, who goes on in, to be uh, one of the main actors in Umbrella Academy. Huh. Yeah, so he uh, he's another one who's picked it up, but he's not even the biggest one of this episode. There's a much bigger one uh, coming up in a, that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, I really like that the woman is slowly realizing that Amy is a kissogram. She's like, oh, you're a policeman now. I thought you were a nurse. It was just her being so accepting and so willing to just go with it. But it's also like you're an adult. I can't I can't pick on you, but I am a little worried right now that you're a stripper. <laughs> and, oh, I think, and I think so I think she almost might have been relieved when she heard not stripper kiss a gram. <laughs> Can you imagine for a second someone hiring a kiss a gram and fucking six foot tall Karen Gillen shows up at your like in your house? No. Could you imagine having your job be to is that you are hired to go to people's parties, look cute and kiss? <laughs> there are some people who that's that's like living the dream. Like, could you even be mad if I was like, yeah, sorry, Zach, I went to a party and there was this really like awesome, like Amazonian woman. <laughs> Like, and I, she was be she was there to kiss people. I had to get do. I had her. to make sure she was she was working her hours. I had to make sure that she was doing her job correct. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and I do like that the doctor's the doctor seems more upset than the grandma does. He's like, "What are you? You were a little girl five minutes ago." <laughs> Like, oh, you sound. Oh, I guess her aunt would be around because she says you sound like my aunt mm-hmm. <laughs> or no, you're worse than my aunt. He's like, I'm the doctor. I'm worse than everybody's aunt, mm-hmm. which is that's a fun bit. I, I don't feel and I feel like that's one of the first lines that feels unique to that doctor. There's mm-hmm. nothing else really. There, that's something that I can't really picture Eccleston or Tennant yelling out. Oh, I could see Tennant yelling that Tennant being everybody's aunt. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> Like Eccleston, no. Tennant, yes. <laughs> Tennant has huge auntie energy. And uh, so they, they start walking around trying to figure out what to do because they realize that the planet's going to be blown up in 20 minutes. Doctor's got 20 minutes to save the world. 20 minutes of convenient runtime left in the episode. <laughs> we only got 20 minutes to save the world. <laughs> And so the no doc- hesitating. Another fun one is they Amy points out that they live in a small town. And so the doctor's like, oh, fuck, I've got 20 minutes to save the world. And I've got and all I've got is a post office and it's closed. <laughs> there's a lot of good quotes in this episode, man. I, yes. There's a lot of moments that I just I have to I'm going to be that way. The doctor realizes that every, everyone else is staring up at the sun as it's getting blocked out by force fields. Everyone except Rory, who is taking a picture of the man that should not be there. They run over and Rory reveals that uh, Amy seems a little reluctant to say so. But Rory is like, no, I'm Amy's boyfriend. Uh, which sort of boyfriend. A sort of boyfriend. You know, Rory, if a girl's not going to be. I mean, I understand Karen Gillan, but also like you should be with someone who's like enthusiastic to be with you. <laughs> you you deserve better than that. But you're a nurse. You got a lot to offer. I don't care that you're an awkward little shy boy. And you're in healthcare. Yeah, you got a you got a steady job. You got Benny's baby. <laughs> when the doctor realizes that what he needs is a laptop, uh, he turns to Amy and goes, "Oh, your friend had a laptop, not not him, the good looking one." And Rory's like, "Oh, thanks." No, him, the good looking one. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, thanks. <laughs> there's a, like there's history in that sentence, and I love it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so the doctor breaks into Jeff's into Jeff's bedroom room in the old lady's house. Yeah, grabs his laptop and goes, "Oh." Get a girlfriend, Jeff. 
Which implies that he was just about to sit there for a little masturbatory session. 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes. Until the world ends. The sun is getting blotted out. My man. (laughs) (laughs) And so the doctor joins a video call with all the most important people in the world. NASA, Tokyo Space, International Banks, and a British astronomer by the name of Patrick Moore. And joins the video call, gives them the secret to faster than light travel several unsolved theorems and a joke legitimately though if somebody was like here are two of the biggest answers to your biggest questions and also a little a little joke you know as a treat yeah which i would believe him in a heartbeat (laughs) and all this just to be like hey i'm gonna send you a computer virus i really need you all to like send this computer virus everywhere it's a little bit alive but it's okay it's just a little bit alive does the computer virus come back at any point i don't think it does okay uh, if, cool. if it does, it's not it's not cop- popping to mind, but it would be really funny. A- Amy and Rory run down to the hospital to try and track down Prisoner Zero. Oh, well, they're supposed to just clear off the uh, the comatosis ward. Yeah. The, yeah uh, the doctor says that it's fine. He's, he'll get there. He'll get there in plenty of time because he's commandeered a vehicle, by which he means a fire truck. She says, how are we going to get in? And he goes, look at a mirror. Oh, right. Cop. They start wandering through the hall and you meet uh, someone else that has been commandeered. Uh, but it, it, can, it, can I tell you something? Sure. It was her holding the hands of the two little children. And mm-hmm. I went, oh, they're all connected. This is a <laughs> farce. This is a form. And uh, speaking of. Arrest uh, this scary lady. Speaking of people who get bit parts in Doctor Who and go on to great fame, this might be the biggest one of all. This is Olivia Coleman. Now Academy Award winning actress Olivia Coleman. Incredible. Uh, yes. Went, wow. How they get such a good actor. Yeah. So, just such a small. Yeah. She, she wasn't famous yet. Uh, now she's gone on to play like Queen Elizabeth in The Crown. And uh, she won. She won an Academy Award for the movie The Favorite. She's been in the she's been in Broadchurch and she's been in Fleabag. She's been in so many things. She's like she's been it. She was in. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't good, but she was in it. She was in the Marvel miniseries Secret Invasion. Mm. Like she's she's got so much going on. But at the time, she hadn't done any of that yet. She was still a few years away from that. So she's got a bit part in Doctor Who playing a woman that sounds like a little girl sometimes. Uh, and I really I really enjoyed that moment where because she's dreaming of being with these two little girls, she's got three mouths and that confuses Prisoner Zero. So she's talking with the wrong mouth and they chase her down the hall and into the comatose ward and they only block her out with a with a broom <laughs> like suspend a the door with a broom. oh yeah yeah of course it's an interdimensional multi-form from outer space they're all terrified of wood broom isn't wood broom Bro- broom is dirt <laughs> <laughs> and so the the doctor makes his way into the into the into the comatose ward by bashing it in with the with the ladder from the fire truck jeez And we start getting uh, why I think Matt Smith was cast for this role in that he can monologue like a motherfucker. (laughs) Like I there are there are some actors that can just absolutely crush a monologue. And Matt Smith is one of them. David Tennant was also one to an extent, but he has this whole thing about how, like, I've saved the world with two minutes to spare. I've set all these clocks to zero. He's given out a whole bunch of gobbledygook, but it sounds so, like, confident and like a winning moment coming from him. And I know that that's that's going to be a a huge feature of his tenure as the doctor is a lot of monologues. Oh, no. (laughs) So I hope you hope you like men that like hearing the sound of their own voice. Well, he even says it. He's tired of he's giving himself an earache yeah. talking to himself so much. Yeah, he he does. He does some sci fi stuff to pin Prisoner Zero in place. And then Prisoner Zero is like, well, I've got another another handy little body I can use to to disguise myself. And he makes Amelia pass or he makes Amy pass out and and starts to use what's in her mind. But in her mind is not her own self. In her mind is the raggedy doctor and her when she was a little girl, which is very sweet. Very sweet and also like, oh God, poor, poor Amelia. Yeah. She's been like haunted by this for 12 years. Yeah. Um, I like the, the doctor's like, well, that's rubbish. Who's that? And Rory goes, that's you. That's what he's like. That's what I look like. 
You don't know? Well, it's been a busy day. Because <laughs> the doctor has not had a spare two seconds to look in the mirror. No, why would he? Or if he has, it's just been like the rear view mirror of the fire truck. It's not been like a full taking stock of his face and sh- and clothes. The doctor has Amy think really hard about when she saw Prisoner Zero's eel form uh, to make the to make Prisoner Zero shift into that body. And I really like the doctor saying, like, congratulations, you've become a perfect imitation of yourself. Why? Why did that stick with you? Because that's what I do every day. I'm a I'm a pitch perfect imitation of myself. I just it's just a fun line. It's just it's it's something that it's one of the it's not one of those things where that line really only works in the context of Doctor Who. And then as as Prisoner Zero gets retrieved, the attracts, he start to fly away. And the doctor's like, no, no, no. He <laughs> calls them, he calls them on Rory's phone, apologizes about how expensive the bill is about to be and says, where where do you think you're going? Get back here <laughs> in a very like. Like, this is one of where, I, where I say, like, yeah, he's he's 26, but he does have the energy of someone much older where it does feel like a parent. Again, he has auntie energy. <laughs> it's like, to- can you imagine like one of like because my mom's an aunt mm-hmm. or like my aunt Denise mm-hmm. just having saved. We'll just we'll downsize it. Save the day from something that they know shouldn't have happened in the first place. Mm-hmm. Do you know the kind of phone calls they would be making afterwards to make sure that everybody knows that this is never going to happen again? (laughs) Yeah, the doctor even says that uh, leaving is good. Never coming back is better. And so the the doctor basically calls them down to to monologue to them on the roof. Uh, But first he has to get changed because he realizes his clothes are all tattered. I like that after all we saw with David Tennant's like suits. They're just left on the floor of a hospital. <laughs> Those suits have seen so much. <laughs> and he just like went. I thought he was taking clothes from like he's taking clothes from the hospital. Like right. Those are patients but what I, clothes. But what I mean, the clothes he took off were David Tennant's clothes. Oh, I understand. And they're just left in the hospital. <laughs> I mean, it was a tattered, nasty yeah. shirt. Um, so he. Did he keep the shoes? Uh, no, he's wearing different shoes, too. Hmm. These were these are more uh, like leather. These are flip flops. No, these are these are leather leather shoes. Tevas. The doctor starts changing clothes using other people's clothes from the hospital, and I like his, he goes turn your back if you're embarrassed. And so Rory turns around and he looks to Amy. He's like, "Aren't you gonna turn around?" And you know what? Amy's earned this. She's waited twelve years for this in Azkaban, <laughs> and she goes, "Nope." Which, in fairness. Matt Smith's, a, Matt Smith's a good looking guy. She also does a very good job at like actively showing that her eyes are eating this up. <laughs> well, it also, it's also it's characterization that we haven't really had for a character. Like we've had characters that are attracted to the doctor, but it was more like uh, like a teenage cutesy uh, like Ro- like Rose, re- like Rose's description of David Hunt was that he had great hair. Or Martha was really into the doctor because he was like really smart and kissed really well. This is the first time we've had someone who's attracted to the doctor because he's got a really nice ass. <laughs> At least a companion. We've had some other characters that are like casually into it, that are casually like attracted to him, that tenant to tenant in that way. Um, <laughs> and so it's kind of funny uh, that it's just a it's just a way to be like this is a more mature character. It also definitely feels like. <laughs> Like, uh, let me have this. Yeah. I've, Where it's the like, I have waited for this person for 12 years. I am going to watch him in his most vulnerable state. And <laughs> I am going to like it because there is a sort of look in her eyes where it's almost where it almost isn't like sexual. It really is more just like vindictive. This, this is one for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, she earned it. Three psychologists later. Four she, psychiatrists that she bit. <laughs> yeah, because they all told her that she was wrong. Yeah, that it, that she was. They all unintentionally were gaslighting her. This is her saying that this is real. Yeah. He's real. He's earned from me. He's real. Yeah, and I, and I <laughs> he's right in front of me. He's real. He's right in front of me and naked and he's real. <laughs> Uh, and so the it is kind of funny to, to think about how what they originally wanted for the 11th Doctor was like a middle aged actor. 
if that scene had played out exactly the same, but <laughs> he looks like 20 years older than she does. Mm. I guess it would depend on the actor. Yeah. But it, but it would be, it's funny if, it, if you picture like Peter Capaldi. Yeah. <laughs> Turn around if it embarrasses you. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and so the doctor walks onto the roof, having put on all these other people's clothes, which he will wear for two seasons. He wears other people. He wears that suit of other people's clothes for the next two seasons. At least he's getting a good use out of them. Yeah, uh, and he's trying on different ties. He's got his suspenders hanging off. He hasn't put those on yet. As he pulls down the Atraxi and he does, I think, a really great monologue about the Earth and about and just it's very simple in the same way that it feels like the like the last monologue Stephen Moffat wrote, which was I'm the doctor and you're in the biggest library in the universe. Look me up. It's that sort of same thing where it's like, is this world protected? And you get like a montage of previous doctor faces. But you're not the first doctor to have come here. Oh, there have been so many. And what you've got to ask is, what happened to them? And I really like that he steps through Tenet to reveal his own face. Mm -hmm. It's just a really fun, like, good beat. And so the Atraxi... The only thing I wish they had done, and I don't know if this was just like a time crunch on it, on the animation, is I kind of wish that when they realize who they're talking to, if the eye, if like the pupil of that eye got just a little bit bigger, mm. it's like, uh, or maybe smaller, smaller might be what it's supposed to be doing. They just go, uh, and then it flies away. That's the only thing I would change about that moment is I wish the eye is I wish the pupil dilated in response to the doctor. The pupil emoted yeah. just a little bit. Uh, and so the doctor, uh, there is a little bit of it. Like, it seems to be really twitching in that moment. Like, it's like, uh, 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 I just kind of wish the eye itself, like the, that the pupil had done something. Before we, we move on too far from that, there is something that the uh, the patient zero says right before he disappears. Mm -hmm. Silence will fall. Mm -hmm. Is that and the Pandorica will open? The Pandora door. The Pandorica. The Pandorica will open. Silence will fall. Are two of the things that he says. Oh man, is that like foreshadowing? It is foreshadowing. <sighs> okay. <laughs> because I, cl I clocked it and then i was like okay great now i just get to sit on this forever yeah, that's the those are parts those are parts of moffat's uh running arcs that he has for uh has for his doctors and so the uh the doctor runs back to the tardis ha ha after the after the attracts he run away the key in his pocket to the tardis gets really hot letting him know that the the tardis it's basically the tardis texting him i'm done yeah <laughs> I'm done cleaning up the mess you made when you blew up inside me like a cake. The TARDIS is done. <laughs> and so the doctor runs to it and all we get is this little orange glow on his face. I'm like, oh, you sexy thing. And so he does what he calls a little, a little pop to the moon and back. And I do like they have this little moment where it cuts back to Amelia sitting on her suitcase in the morning. Which I don't know if that means she sat on that suitcase for hours or if she just walks out there periodically and hopes the doctor will show up then. Which is I, sadder. I, I think that it's she sat and waited. Yeah, because uh, she, well, she's also wearing the same outfit, which would sort of imply that's the case. And she hears it and she smiles, but the doctor doesn't show up. Then the doctor shows up uh, apparently even later, two years later <laughs> to uh, to which which Amy is upset about again. And. Uh, the doctor invites Amy to come along. I do. There's a part of me that would be kind of I would kind of enjoy seeing the doctor with a child companion like Amelia. I'm not going to complain about getting Karen Gillan. She's an incredibly talented actress. And so the doctor shows Amy the inside of his new TARDIS. And uh, I heard you audibly go, ooh, I just like orange. What did you uh, what did you think about the, the new I like TARDIS orange? I like all of the found objects in it. Very magpie. Yeah. The, the console has like hot and cold sink knobs on yeah, it. There was a, a like a phonograph, but just like the horn part. Mm -hmm, there's a typewriter a typewriter. It's just it is very much a like what if an antique shop turned into a time machine? <laughs> 
Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. Very much so. It feels less sci-fi and more like, okay, cool. The doctor is becoming more human. These are items that he seems to have found and has and has collected over. <laughs> it was all just stuff that was in Amy's shed that <laughs> when the TARDIS crashed into it, the TARDIS just picked all of it up. Like, this is mine now. I need this for science. Perhaps, but it's just nice because it's like he even says that he's put a lot of work into this earth. Mm -hmm. And so there's it's it's a way that you can like physically see that the doctor is not only fascinated by humans, Mm -hmm. but also like loves humans. Mm -hmm. Just look at all this neat stuff. <laughs> it's very 22 look at this stuff. Isn't it? Neat? It's very 22 in soul where she's like, your mom like made this jacket with this needle and or repaired this jacket with needle and thread. Like, like I, I got this lollipop. Like it is just very like this ethereal being, this person that isn't a person. Mm hmm. Just t- having those like little earthly items that are like, this is what is grounding. Him. Like those items is what grounds him. Mm-hmm. And I think serves as like a, not a reminder of like why he does what he does, but just a reminder of like, you know, these are the things that you have found and collected. These are like the your cool items. Yeah. And also some other little details. I know that I know that you're picking up all, all little things, but there's also, I don't know if you thought there's a staircase in there now. Uh, there, the underneath the console of the TARDIS is a mm-hmm. glass floor as mm-hmm. opposed to the metal grating. Um, and also, I don't know if I don't know if you would have picked up on this, if there is a way for you to have picked up on this. When it, Tennant and Eccleston's TARDIS was uh, only like three quarters of a set. Basically, there wasn't there was an open wall of the TARDIS mm-hmm. that they always filmed through. This TARDIS is a closed set. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so all four walls of the TARDIS exist in here so they could film it at any angle in there they want to. And so that, that that's kind of a fun thing that they play with is that you get to really feel the inside of the TARDIS. This also, I think, especially compared to Tennant and Eccleston, this TARDIS feels like there are other rooms in there. Yeah. Uh, tar- <laughs> something about just like the way it was like round and you couldn't really see anywhere for you to go somewhere else. I, I think it's because you do have now the sense of this is like this is the closed space, but we've seen now most of this closed space. So now the possibilities of there being more space mm-hmm. and because we specifically have him at the top of the episode say that he was in the library and the pool was in the library. Yeah, and now he doesn't know where the swimming pool is anymore. It might or the library. <laughs> it might it might be in the wardrobe. The TARDIS also gives him a new sonic screwdriver because the one for tenant got all fritzy and it kind of blew up and, and when he tried there's a part in it where the doctor tries to like alert the Atraxi to come find prisoner zero, but in doing so he blows up the sonic screwdriver. But so yeah, now this one's green. This one's green and it's got like bronze and silver accents. I I just I love that design. That is still my favorite sonic screwdriver. Uh, far I like that it's got. I don't know if you've seen all the features on it yet, but it's got this little like extended. Of course, claw. I didn't, dude. We've seen it for maybe fifteen okay. seconds. It, but yeah, this one feels the. This one, I, I this is my favorite. I I had I I had one for a long time until it broke, and I've ordered another one because we started watching it and we want one again. Um, it hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> And so I like that when he when he picks it up, though, he goes, thanks, darling. And he basically has to convince Amy to come along. But Amy kind of already wants to go. Well, she's always wanted to go. She packed a bag the night they met. because yep. She was already ready to go. Yeah, it, it is funny that she was so prepared when she was a little girl. And now she could not be less prepared by the fact that she's in her nighty. She's she's dressed for sleep. Not not in her hat and coat with her full suitcase. She walks in in her in her bedroom attire. Now there's clothes somewhere. Well, there's there are clothes in her room. Uh, yep, yeah, there are clothes in her room because Amy. Hey, uh, speaking of which, do you know what my favorite clothes in her room was? A wedding dress. Yeah, Amy says that she needs to get back for tomorrow morning because she's getting married in the morning. <laughs> OK. Bet. Yeah, that's a that's an that's an interesting aspect we've never had for a companion before. We never had a companion that is running from something. Especially something so human. 
Mm-hmm. Like we've had companions that have like been attacked by aliens all the time. But we've never had one that's like, I'm going to leave with you because I'm scared about getting married in the morning. Well, because the only other companion that was getting married was uh, Donna. Donna, yeah. But what I mean is like that's there's that, you we've, we've had we've had like Martha who's getting chased by rhinos and Rose who was getting chased by plastic people. None of them have ever been chased by their own fears is what I was getting at. And so there's that's an interesting aspect of it that we'll get to as we get into this season. Um, Do you have any other uh, thoughts so far that you're think that you're thinking about? Beans are evil. Bad, bad beans. <laughs> beans are evil. Bad, bad beans. Uh, we'll find out if beans continue being evil on the next episode of Who is My Doctor? Who is my doctor? Who is indeed? <laughs>